Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissing. And this is a show for you if you're bored of people arguing on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our brilliant expert guest this week is the Head of Education at the Institute of Economic Affairs, Dr. Stephen Davis. Welcome to Trigonometry. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming and what a time to be here because exciting things are happening in British politics and you've been talking about this for a long time. And before we get into that, just tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, what's been your journey through life so that us and our viewers know everything well, about you. Um, to start at the beginning, I suppose, uh, I was born in Scotland in a place called Grangemouth, went to university in Scotland uh, at St Andrews. I'm a historian by training, although I talk a lot about economics these days. My family roots are all in Manchester and East Lancashire, Burnley to be precise, and Newton Heath in Manchester. Lived in Manchester since 1979, uh, staunch city fan. Uh, I used to work <laughs> at the Manchester Metropolitan University, uh, Manchester Polytechnic as it was before then. Uh, but a few years ago, I kicked the world of academia into touch and I went full time into the think tank world, which I'd been involved with for quite a long time, actually. Uh, and I worked first for a think tank in the United States called the Institute for Humane Studies uh, and then uh, at the Institute of Economic Affairs for the last nine to ten years or so. And I do other kinds of um, freelance work as well. So that's where I am at the moment, really, looking forward to City winning the title and denying Liverpool the title again. Uh, and uh, also, you know, taking a great interest in what's going on in the world right well, now. Well, you've managed to trigger a big portion of our, our following already with, with those comments. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, we're called Trigonometry for a reason. But uh, it's it's so great to have you here because, as I said, uh, we're recording this uh, the, the vi this video will come out about a week or so from now. Mm. But so far, you, you've been talking about a realignment of politics yes. for a long time. And as we discussed before the show, not everyone was immediately kind of receptive to that idea. Yeah. But you've been talking about it for five or six years and it's actually happening. I think as, as we speak, 11 MPs have left their mainstream parties, eight Labour, three Conservatives, yeah. uh, to create this independent group. Yeah. So take us back to the beginning. What is this all about? Well... There's, you need to distinguish between the factional moves in Parliament, which are fascinating and interesting, but, and on the one hand, and behind that, the underlying structural changes in politics, which is what I mean by realignment. Now, the way to understand that is this. At most times, lots of people have disagreements about all kinds of things. Uh, but what we don't ever do in any country is elect lots of individual politicians who then form shifting ad hoc coalitions around each particular issue as it arises. What you find instead is that there's always one issue, or maybe two, which are the aligning issue. People group into large political blocks or tribes depending on the view that they have of that one big issue. Now that tribe that agrees on one side of that big issue will probably have lots of internal disagreements about other issues, but the, that's not, that doesn't matter because politics is aligned around the one big issue. Mm. So for uh, the last 40, 50 years or so, the two big issues have been on the one hand, whether or not you favor free markets or state control of the economy, and on the other hand, whether or not you think that uh, the state has a role to play in enforcing moral rules. Mm. So with that second issue, at one end of the poll, you could be John Stuart Mill, you think people should be allowed to do whatever they like, with within almost no limits. At the other end, you could be, well, you could be like a former guest of yours, Peter Hitchens, who thinks that, you know, the state should be doing all kinds of things to stop people, you know, taking cannabis and various other kinds of things Peter doesn't approve of. Uh, so when you put those two... Well done getting that dig in. Well yeah. done. <laughs> when, you, when you put those two axes together, you end up with four broad blocks of voters. And the split which for the last 30 to 40 years has been between uh, one group who are pro-market but socially conservative like US Republicans, for example, and another group who are not exactly anti-market, but pro-government intervention in the economy, but socially liberal, like US Democrats, for example. That's been the split. Now, my argument is that while the economic division is still there, the other division has changed. We're seeing a new division appearing in politics, and the division here is between nationalists and globalists, basically. 
It's between people who think that the nation state is a vital political institution and who favor traditional national identity as opposed to people who think that um, national identity is only one part of what you are, not necessarily the most important thing, uh, and that you need to move towards a world of more open borders, freer trade, freer movement, more supranational forms of government like the EU perhaps. And that's the emerging division, I think, in most um, countries. The problem we have in Britain, and indeed many other countries, is that our two big parties don't match up to that new division. The division between globalist and nationalist splits both of the two parties down the middle. And so what is happening is that, in fact, that real division out there in the public is now not yet reflected by the parties. But the parties are reorganizing themselves, if you will, uh, to get more in line with this newly emerging division. That's what I mean by realignment. And one of the things you've talked about before you jump in, Francis, is that this is just the beginning. Yes. Uh, what's happening in party political terms within Britain is just the beginning. So uh, you've been predicting things for a while. You maybe didn't get as much credit as you deserve. How about you, you use this opportunity to make a bunch of other predictions so you yeah. can then go, look, look, I was oh, right okay. all along. I think what is going to happen is, is this. First of all, the defections we've seen to this independent group are only the start of a process. Uh, quite a lot more Labour MPs and a few more Conservative MPs are going to defect. This has probably been arranged and set up in advance, and I imagine that what you're going to see is a steady stream of defections. This is being done for media management purposes. It, it's to keep the story in the headlines over time. That's how it's actually organised. Are you saying politicians are behaving cynically? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. My word, perish the thought, eh? But yes, unfortunately so. Uh, so that's what is going to happen. now. The, the context for all these splits in Parliament at the moment is that we can't have a general election because of the Fixed Term Parliament Act, which means that you need two-thirds of MPs to vote for a general election. And there's always going to be at least a third of Parliament at the moment who don't want a general election for the good reason that they fear they'll lose their seats. Mm -hmm. So there isn't going to be a majority for dissolving Parliament at the moment. Plus, you could do it with a no-confidence vote, but as recent events have shown, even if the government has lost its majority, there's still a majority who think that they do not want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister, and so she's not going to lose a confidence vote. So we aren't going to have a general election. At the same time, we have a hard legal deadline for leaving the EU on the 29th of March, and that basically means that Parliament has become a pressure cooker, and all the divisions within the parties are becoming more and more intense and it's leading both of the parties to fracture and the emergence of quite distinct groups in Parliament which I think will become the sort of parliamentary wings of two new parties effectively. Certainly one new party, maybe two. Because it's interesting you're talking about all of this and, and but there is a party out there that is Broadly centrist, pro-Remain, <laughs> yeah. to Liberal Democrats. Why is no one joining the Lib Dems? That's a, that's a very good question. And I think it's partly because they still haven't gotten over the, for them, near-fatal experience of being in coalition with the Conservatives. Uh, they should have learned from history. Whenever the Labour Party, the Liberal Party rather, has historically gone into coalition or supported one of the other two parties, it's been the kiss of death. Mm. And I think they still haven't gotten over that. Plus, they have the problem that they have a number of outstanding MPs but nobody who's in a really prominent leadership role who ticks that box of really appealing to a wide part of the public. They don't have any, uh, any leaders left who are still comfortable with gay sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, yes. That, that's the problem that they've got, really, isn't it? Yes. Um, so uh, how big is this independent group going to be uh, two or three months from now, do you think? I think it could be about 40 to 50 members of parliament. Mm. Uh, I would not be surprised. I, it may be, I would say... We're probably going to see about another 20 Labour MPs leave and another nine or so Conservative MPs. So several of Tory MPs like Nick Bowles have said that uh, they're basically waiting to see how votes go on various Brexit amendments in Parliament. But I think that's pretty much certain. He, they're not going to way, go the way he wants to, them to and therefore he's going to leave. And I think this is true of quite a number of other MPs. What role did Brexit play in this? Was it the catalyst or was this always going to happen? I think that this realignment was always going to happen, but Brexit was the catalyst. And the lit that's a very good analogy, because in chemistry, a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction, but isn't actually involved in the reaction. And that's exactly what Brexit has done. It's made the realignment of British politics around nationalism versus cosmopolitanism happen much more quickly than it otherwise would have done. And Brexit, and how you feel about leave or remain, 
is a kind of proxy for a whole lot of other issues. Mm. Uh, issues and feelings about identity. A very revealing poll, you'll find this entertaining perhaps, about Leavers and Remainers was to ask them what their favourite brands were. And the favourite Leavers brands were things like Hovis, Bisto, HP Sauce, Heinz Baked Beans, a whole list of quintessentially 1950s traditional British brands. The favourite brands of Remain voters were things like Uber, Apple, uh, iMac, uh, a whole range of very du jour, modish, trendy brands. That tells you a huge amount, which is that the division between Remain and Leave is actually just the expression of a much deeper, if you like, cultural divide, which is partly a division between old and young, partly between North and the Midlands and the South, partly between professional and university educated and traditional working class or middle class, a whole series of social and cultural divisions like that. It's, the, you talk about the divisions. I always try and think, how are we going to heal these divisions? Well, that's what politics is about. Um, realignments of this kind take place every 40 years or so. Mm. So we had one in the 1880s, 1885 to 1893. We had one in the 1920s, 20, 1922 to 31. We had one in the 1970s and early 80s. Each time you have a realignment, initially politics is very, very bitter. That's because the new issue is one that people have, it's fresh. People are very divided by it. There isn't much centre ground, but what the democratic political process does is that over time, over 10, 20 years or so, the sort of bitterness and starkness of that division is ameliorated, and actually you do get the emergence of a centre. I'm actually quite excited, like, as someone who's, who's horrified by the extremes on both sides, which seem to, be, to have kind of got hold of the microphone recently, and they're, they're, they're the ones that are getting all the attention, both on the left and on the right. I'm quite excited about the idea that you have a new centrist force emerging, on the one hand. Mm. On the other hand, I look at these, the people who are forming this group, and it seems to me like the number one driving force behind their, their motivation in terms of creating this is really these are people who are vehemently opposed to Brexit. That's what's yeah. forced them to leave their yeah. parties. And as, as we, we were talking just before we started, that's not necessarily a very centrist no. point of view. So, so it's a party that's allegedly in the centre, or it's a group for now that's allegedly in the centre, but... It's not, actually. Um, the thing is this, when you have a political realignment, what happens is that the centre is redefined. Because when you have a stable alignment, when everybody knows that the big dividing issue is one particular question, uh, you know where you stand on that issue, and there's going to be a lot of people who are in the middle of that issue. So in the, fame, the classic one of state control of the economy versus free markets, you had radical laissez-faire free marketers on the one hand, you had people like Jeremy Corbyn, old-fashioned socialists on the other end, and then in between there was a middle. Now, when the alignment changes, when the issue that politics is aligned around becomes a different one, what you find is that the centre is redefined, and people who were in the centre on the old issue may not be in the centre on the new one. Now, the people you're, the, if the new aligning issue, as I argue, is internationalism versus nationalism, then people like Chukaramuna, Anna Subri, and all the others who've left to form this independent group, they're actually pretty far out to one extreme of that mm. new alignment. So actually, it's a mistake to think of them as centrist. The centre, what it is to be in the centre, is being redefined. On the other hand, by the way, that means that you should not feel that the centre has collapsed which is a kind of common perspective that I think you've just articulated. That's not what's going on. What's happening is that what it is to be uh, in the centre has a different content now to what it did before. To be in the centre used to mean that you favoured a moderate degree of state intervention, but a broadly, with a, maybe quite a big welfare state, but a broadly market economy. Tony Blair, basically. Mm. Mm. What without, the, without the wars. Without the wars, yes. Yeah. And all, all, all that stuff. Let's draw veil over that. Uh, but the... Um, what, what being in the centre was going to mean in a couple of years' time is that you favour a certain amount of immigration control, but you're not a hardline nativist nationalist. You are broadly in favour of international cooperation, but you don't want the kind of complete merging of sovereignty that the EU means. That's what the new centre is going to be, essentially. So the, you're still, you still have a centre position, but the content of that position is determined by what the underlying alignment is. And as I say, this new party is basically the globalist internationalist 
party. The thing is, they, they haven't quite got their heads around that. The other problem is that um, I'm afraid to say quite a lot of them typify another phenomenon of the last 20 years, which is the professional political class. Mm. Um, not all of them, but quite a lot of them do. And the British public, quite honestly, is totally fed up with uh, mass-produced, manicured politicians of the kind that Peter Mandelson has you know, left us as his legacy, God help him. And uh, that, that sort of, that's one of the reasons why Jeremy Corbyn is popular. He doesn't fit mm. that kind of stereotype. Mm. Nor does Jacob Rees-Mogg, another Nor reason why Nigel he's... Farage. Yeah. Farage, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> These are, that's why the public is at the moment in the market for politicians who are seen to be their own man or woman and not uh, a kind of identikit done PPB at Oxford and you know gone to um, the right schools and got kind of identikit set of views, politicians. So they need to uh, find some way of giving themselves a distinctive identity. But I think that will actually happen because as I say, what's going on in Parliament is only the kind of froth on the top of a much more profound social uh, shift. But it's also quite regressive when you think about it, like you said, because the reality is we voted for Brexit. We have to, we mm. have to leave. So by actually choosing to go this particular route, aren't you just denying a reality? Well, not necessarily. The, I think as long as these people insist that they want a second vote, they are denying reality. And I think that's an extremely dangerous road to go down. Uh, I think that if we were to have a second referendum, the political consequences, consequences would be disastrous. That would give the biggest boost ever to people like Tommy Robinson and other uh, political pond life and the, the far right, if you want to call it that. Mm. I think it would be really a really big mistake. And as you say, the public was asked to vote on this issue. They were told the result of the issue would be enacted by Parliament. So to say, well, sorry, you got it wrong. Let's you know, have another try uh, would be incredibly offensive. What I think this group is moving towards, though, and I think will be forced to move towards, is the position that, OK, we're going to leave, we deeply regret it, and we're going to campaign that we should rejoin. And rejoin? I, I think that's what their position is going to be. Oh, I, I do not see a wide public support for rejoining. Oh, you'd be the... surprised. I really? Think, I think there is... There, to go back to the point I made earlier, there was a poll done recently which showed that people's attachment to their party loyalty identity as conservative voters, Labour voters, whatever, was very, very weak. Uh, less than 20, less than 30 percent felt a strong identification with their party. Over 75 percent felt a very powerful identification with their status as leave or remain voters. And I think you underestimate the degree to which there's a very powerful constituency of unreconciled remainers out there in the country, about 25%, roughly, I would say, of the voters. And that's basically the constituency that this new party that's emerging at the moment is going to appeal to. But do you not think that's kind of like polling boxers in the middle of a boxing match? Like, yeah, I hate them, but once the fight is over, they're all hugging and whatever. Like, once we Brexit happens, people will be reconciled to the fact that uh, it's happened. And I, well, some people will be, but I think that there are going to be, like I say, about 25% of the voters, 25 to 30% who are utterly unreconciled. Mm. And the, the, um, these are the people who have a genuine, strong ideological commitment, if you like, to the European project. Uh, there, there aren't enough of them to win the referendum, which is why there wasn't a positive pro-EU case made during the referendum. Mm. That's why instead we got this ridiculous kind of project fear nonsense from George Osborne and others about how the sky was going to fall in if we voted to leave. But that is a significant block of voters. And the other thing about them is they're geographically concentrated. That 25 to 30 percent of unreconciled remainers have a distinct social profile. They're typically younger, more educated, middle class professionals, and they live overwhelmingly in London, the South East, and middle class enclaves like Wilmslow or uh, Thornaby uh, outside London. So, on places like Oxford as well and Cambridge. Um, so, they have a, that means that the political prospects for a new party of this kind are actually better than people might imagine. Mm. The big problem the SDP had historically, for example, was that its vote was very evenly spread around the country, which in our electoral system gets you absolutely nowhere. Whereas this party, I think, will have a much more concentrated vote. So, and they can have like an SNP like impact? That's quite possible, yes, uh -huh. I think so. But they're never realistically going to get into power. Well, what is likely to happen is that we will see over the next couple of years some pretty confused politics, like we did in the early part of the 1920s, for example. I think it's quite likely we'll have hung parliaments. Now, we may have a change in the electoral system. That's, yeah. that's a possibility. The main reason why we stick with first-past-the-post is because it yields decisive results. If it stops doing that, mm. 
the case for changing the system becomes quite strong. On the other hand, it could well be that actually what will happen is that after a few rather confusing elections, we'll end up with two large parties, and this breakaway faction will either become the core of one of them, or it will transform one of the two existing parties in a way that makes it into a party rather like the one that they want to have. Uh, I think the first is actually more likely than the second. Do you think part of the problem as well is that there, it doesn't <coughs> seem to be a political party out there that represents the working class? That you talk to a lot of working class people and they say, Labour doesn't represent me anymore, which is a very dangerous place to be politically because that's when somebody, you know, like the far rights or whatever yeah. type of people can swoop in and appeal directly to that electorate, which is the majority. I couldn't agree more. If you look all across Europe, social democratic parties are in really, really big trouble. <clears throat> the Dutch Labour Party, for example, which is one of the dominant parties in Dutch politics from the 1900s onwards, at the last election in the Netherlands, they only got about 5% of the vote. A catastrophic collapse. Mm. The French Socialist Party has basically completely imploded. It hardly exists anymore. Mm. And the reason is that social democratic left-wing parties all over Europe now find that they are trying to appeal to two different kinds of voters. Traditional working class voters, their traditional core base, and on the other hand, the kind of people I was talking about, young, green-minded, environmentally conscious university graduates who are interested in a totally different agenda, an agenda about what you might call left-wing identity politics, supranationalism, cosmopolitanism. Now, those two blocks of voters agree about economics, but they don't agree about anything else. And the whole cultural politics of the kind of middle class post-1968 new left alienates those working class voters massively. And the danger, as we can see, say, in Germany, is that there, the SPD's working class voters, a lot of them have switched to the far right AFD party. Mm. And that's the risk uh, that could happen here. It could have happened with UKIP, except that UKIP you know, basically imploded and went up its own fundament, um, partly because it, it was full of um, you know, complete cranks and nut jobs, basically, <laughs> but not to be, to be blunt about it. But you're right. If there's a block of about 30 to 35 percent of the population, uh, traditional working class communities in small towns, parts of the Midlands and north of England, who feel not only that they're not being represented, <coughs> excuse me, but that they're being condescended to, mm. talked down to, and despised mm. by educated middle class elites mm. in their own party, things could get really unpleasant. Well, that's what's been happening. That's what you're talking about, which yeah. is, you know, uh, a labourer from Hull being talked down to by some vegan Corbynista. It's not going to go Absolutely. down well. Absolutely. That's not going to go down well at all. People will put up with a lot, but being patronised is something that really annoys most people. They're, they're just not going to take it. Mm. So if you were Jeremy Corbyn, and <laughs> whoa, whoa, you don't I'm need to say so again. <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> Jesus. So it, it, but if you were a Labour leader, how would you try and unite these two tribes? Or is it simply impossible? I think it's very difficult, almost impossible, actually. What you would have to do is to really bang on all the time about economics, because that's the one mm. subject that those two blocks of voters agree upon. And what you would have to do is seriously downplay the cultural leftism, the identity politics, the anti-imperialism, which leads into anti-Semitism in the current case in the Labour Party, uh, the sort of obsession with... Um, quite radical identity politics around you know things like gay rights and so on not that there's anything wrong with that but the point is you shouldn't make that the, your your major theme you should instead emphasize working class self-interest and traditional very traditional left of center economics more Marx and less postmodernism if you will mm. uh, that's what you would need to do to try and keep those two blocks of voters on board uh, I do think, though, that it's very, very difficult. I have quite a lot of sympathy for Jeremy Corbyn, actually. I think he's got a very difficult job. And obviously the schism or the crack in between those two blocks is Brexit, because as we all know, a, Absolutely. Lot of, yeah. a lot of white working class voters voted Brexit, and the other side yeah. of them demonised them as racist and thick for doing it. Precisely. And if you look at the... That's an example of the cultural split I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the... Read papers like The Guardian, uh, the in-house paper, paper for Remainers, what they all constantly go on about is how 60 to 70 percent of Labour voters voted uh, Remain. Well, that is true. But the problem is those, the 30 percent who voted Leave are overwhelmingly Labour's traditional working class vote. Mm -hmm. And they're geographically very concentrated in small towns, the North and the Midlands, which is why a majority of Labour seats voted Leave. 
often by massive margins. Mm. You know, you're talking about 70 to 80 yeah. percent leave votes in places like Sunderland, south parts of South Yorkshire, parts of the West Midlands. So the fact that you've got a ton of Labour voters mostly living in safe Tory seats who voted Remain uh, is not going to help you win the general election if you're identified as being the pro-Remain party when all the great majority of your voters in actual Labour seats are strongly leave. And that's where there's this huge cultural split, as you say, right down the middle of that existing Labour coalition. And I think trying to hold it together is almost certainly going to be you know, impossible. Just as an aside as well, actually, I think even that is uh, underestimating the case because a, a lot of those traditional <coughs> Labour voters, they stopped voting for That's several true. elections. So yeah. when they've come back into the system to vote in the referendum, by that point, they weren't really Labour voters anymore. But actually, yeah. they are that base that you talk about. Yeah. So let, let's let's talk about identity politics and the direction that mm. that's going. What do you make of that? Well, I think at the moment, what you're seeing is, is a big division between two... This is part of the new alignment. There's a big division between two different ways of conceiving of identity. One way has it that your identity is largely something that's given to you. You don't really choose to be what you are. It's determined by things like who your parents are, where you're born, where you live, where you grow up, a whole number of factors that ultimately you don't control. The contrary view is that your identity should, as far as possible, be self-made, that you should it should be what you have chosen to be. Now, you can see this most clearly in sexual identity. That, that's a kind of key point issue here, where on the one hand you have people who say, well, basically there's a kind of biological fact that you have no control over, that you're a man or a woman and that's it. Uh, you have a sexual orientation and that's it. On the other hand, there are people who say, well, no, actually, because of modern technology and for other reasons, this is actually a matter of choice. You choose to define what your sexual identity is, what kind of a person you are, what you are. And that's the division. It's a division between two different um, ways of conceiving or structuring your identity. That also plays into arguments about national identity because one view would have it that, well, you are born in a particular part of the world, you are brought up within a particular national culture and tradition, and therefore you have a kind of identity which you haven't chosen uh, and which you are a part, which is part of you and which is important for you that is it's maintained and it's upheld. Otherwise, the world is going to become a rather strange threatening place for you. The contrary view is that, no, you're living in a world of easy travel, of globally interconnected cities, uh, which a, a world economy which has low, long supply chains that go halfway around the world to produce everyday products. And in that world, uh, you basically can choose to live where you want, be the kind of person you want, and you can also, to a great degree, construct a kind of whole set of overlapping identities for yourself by almost picking and choosing between different cultural traditions. Those are two radically different ways of understanding um, what social identity is, and I think that's what the big division is. And that also ties into Brexit, mm. Brexit as well, whether you see yourself as UK and whether you see yourself as European. Yeah. The question I really wanted to ask is, is this the end of the Labour Party as we know it? Uh, I think in some senses, when Jeremy Corbyn won that election, uh, as I said at a sort of immediate aftermath of that, it, the Labour Party had been transformed. It was a new party at that point. So what often happens actually in British politics is that you have a party with the same name, but it's completely different from what that party was uh, 10 years before. It's like the famous problem of Trigger's broom. You know, 10 new handles, four new heads, but still the same broom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so in the same way, if you think about it historically, to give a historical example, the Conservative Party by the end of the 1920s was a completely different kind of party in terms of the people who were in it, the people who voted for it, to what it had been before the First World War. It had changed basically from being an aristocratic party to being a business party, if you want to put it that way. Mm. So I think what happened with, uh, with the Labour Party is that it was a shell party. Uh, under the Blair, R Blair and Brown, the party's membership had shrunk dramatically. There was almost nothing left. And then all these thousands of uh, Corbynistas joined the party with great enthusiasm, uh, and essentially it became a new party. Now the question is, what kind of party is that? And I think the issue, which is what we were alluding to a moment ago, is, is it going to continue being a traditional working class party, or will it become a party of the radical populist left, like, say, Podemos in Spain, or maybe the Greens in Germany, um, 
or Cyrisia in, in Greece, that kind of, that kind of thing. Uh, I would have to say that uh, that's an open question because the, the other factor in this is the trades unions who are still, of course, enormously powerful institutions in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. And obviously they represent the traditional working class aspect of it. However, the leadership of the trades unions has moved a long way away from those organisations' traditional working class roots. So at the moment, I, we will probably have a party called the Labour Party around, but I suspect it is going to be less and less of a working class party. Now, in that case, to go back to the point you raised earlier, what kind of political force is then going to be able to articulate mm. working class interests and identity and concerns? Uh, and that could have a rather bad answer if we're not careful. Mm. So that for Tommy Robinson, that is a very rich scene for him to plow. If, if, uh, if, if, if things don't work out, yes. The, fortunately, people like him are still largely not taken seriously or are discredited because of their association with thuggery and violence which not surprisingly, you know, puts a lot of people off. The danger is that somebody will arise who is uh, charismatic, persuasive, articulates the views and interests of a lot of people very effectively, but who doesn't have the kind of baggage that people like Tommy Robinson or the football lads or whatever they call themselves have. Football lads alliance. Mm -hmm. But yeah. would you say the danger, but if someone came along who, you know, pe we get a lot of shit actually for criticizing Tommy Robinson ourselves. You yeah. Know? Oh, um, I do, yeah. Yeah, what? Well, yeah, you deserve it though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but um, you, we, but the, the issue with him is uh, I've listened to his Oxford Union talk. He, he, he explains a lot of things quite articulately very well, but it's the association with violence and thuggery, as you yeah. say, that, that for us is a problem. Like a lot yeah. of people want us to interview him, and we're like, well, he does say some things that are interesting mm. and that are valid, but that association is a problem for us, right? But, but if someone was to come along and articulate the views and the needs and the interests of working class people up and down this country who was not violent, who wasn't coming from that background, what's wrong with that? Uh, actually, I don't think there is anything wrong with that. I mean, yeah. I think what is But you actually, said it was a yeah, danger. I know. But, well, okay, I mean, perhaps let me rephrase phrase it or exp expand it slightly. I think it is very dangerous to have a significant block of voters whose views, concerns, interests are not being articulated. Yes. That's very dangerous. Mm, yes. And one of the problems I think we've had in democratic politics in most developed countries over the last 30 years is the narrowing of the range of concerns and interests that are represented. Basically, if you're a university graduate and uh, have a certain set of views and you're working in certain areas of the economy, things are pretty good. Your mm. views are being discussed, but for a lot of other people, it's not the case, and it's very dangerous. Now, the question is, given that, what form does the politics that represents those unrepresented, currently unrepresented interests take? So if you like, in the past, working class interests were not represented at the end of the 19th century. So there were two different routes that their representation took. One was to, for them to be represented by uh, radical, but democratic parties like the Labour Party, parties that, you know, were not prepared to subvert civil liberties, were committed to preserving the main institutions of the democratic political process and the like. The other route in, say, France, for example, was to go and vote for the Communist Party, a revolutionary party that, to put it mildly, was not interested in maintaining democratic norms or liberal rights. So when we are talking about an unrepresented uh, working class or a working class that feels itself to be unrepresented, which maps the same thing. The question is then what kind of politics comes along to express it? If it's a kind of politics which does articulate their concerns and interests, but combines that with a kind of radical revolutionary rhetoric or a commitment to violence and the destruction of their political opponents, that's extremely dangerous. Uh, on the other hand, if it is a kind of politics which says, look, here we have a set of views and concerns that are not being taken seriously. We think they should be taken seriously, but does so within what you might call the rules of the democratic system. Mm. That can't help but be a good thing because it means that the people who disagree with those views or who have queries about them will at least have to take them seriously and engage with them. And that's right, well, what happens. This is the thing. Well, can I just... Now, we've been talking about this political figure. Maybe it's me because yeah. I'm not... Uh, because I'm not as au fait with politics as everyone, but we're talking about this figure who has led a movement that is a little bit revolutionary, uh, addresses working class people's views. It's Nigel Farage, isn't it? That's what I was about to, to say. To some degree, yes, absolutely. Um, the only the problem that uh, I think Nigel Farage and his sort of like the, the element of UKIP that he represented had was that he was 
articulating those concerns, but he also combined it with a kind of economic position, which personally I favour, but which was not going to, I think, appeal to um, the, the audience he was also uh, speaking for. Because I think the crucial thing is that you've got, it, uh, if you think of there being a four-way block, four quadrants, really, you've, if the vertical axis up here is this whole question of identity that we're talking about, um, the other axis is how you feel about economics still. Mm -hmm. And so you've got on the one hand down here, a block of voters, largely working class, not entirely, who are both left wing on economics and nationalist or culturally traditionalist. Mm -hmm. Over here you have a block of voters who share the cultural traditionalism, but who are much more free market or less mm -hmm. um, left of center in economics. Now up here on the other hand, you've got on the one hand, the kind of people that the independent group are appealing to, liberal cosmopolitans, broadly free market, very globalist, and up here you've got the far left, you've got momentum and the Greens. Now, yeah. the problem is that I think Nigel Farage is down in this quadrant, mm. and his economic view, the, his views on things like national identity, opposition to the EU, they appeal to those working class voters over here, but his economic views did not. The big gap in the market, if you will, is for a party that is um, left of centre in economics, uh, but traditionally nationalist, what I would call a national collectivist party. This is what the Front National in France is. That's mm. what Marine Le Pen has turned mm. it into. Um, and I think that that's the kind of big gap in the market, if you will. So and it's like a left-wing Nigel Farage. Exactly, yeah. something uh, like that. And isn't that what the Labour Party used to be? Indeed, up until, <laughs> but it hasn't been that for a long time, because I think what happened was that from the 19, or as early as the 1960s perhaps, certainly from the 1980s onwards, the Labour Party became much less of a working class party in terms of its leadership anyway, and much more dominated by middle class professionals who tended to emphasize the social aspect of the uh, Labour Party's agenda rather than the economic aspect. And do you think a lot of this comes from politicians who are career politicians and their detachment from everyday people and their issues and the travails that they have and the difficulties that they face? To some degree, but I think that's a phenomenon really of the last 15, no more than 20 years, uh, career politicians of that kind, the political class, as I, I referred to earlier. I think what, what you've got with, our MPs are in a better position actually than MP or politicians in many other countries because they represent particular geographical constituencies and because every week they have to go and do surgeries and they actually come into contact with voters on a much more direct basis, I think, than... Uh, politicians in, say, France or Germany or Italy do. Uh, so th there's, l there's a constant sort of feedback mechanism there. The problem is, though, that to get a nomination, to advance within the party machinery, to get to the point where you get a winnable seat, you have to become one of these professional politicians. Didn't used to be the case. There used to be lots of ways in which you could get into politics. You could do it through being in the law or business, particularly in the Conservative Party. You could do it through being a trade union official or activist in the Labour Party. Both parties took people from the military and other mm. professions. That's no longer the case. You can only become an MP by going through a very strictly structured career route, which involves having no proper job, or what most people regard as a proper job, <laughs> uh, going to a very limited number of academic institutions during your academic career, uh, and basically studying a pretty limited range of topics. The number of people who've done PPE at Oxford uh, or in Parliament is remarkable. And the result is, therefore, an extremely narrow basis. Now, having then got into Parliament, that process I described means they're then made to realise that maybe the world they've been working in for uh, nine, ten years or so is not the whole of the world. But the problem is that's what they are. And so I think, yes, that is a problem. Do you think, given that you've talked about the fact that we're going to get possibly a few hung parliaments and that lack of decisiveness that we, we crave from the first past the post system, do you think we need PR? Do you think we need proportional representation? Is it a good um, thing for I this think, country? I think I, I would support some kinds of PR, but not others, basically. I would be totally against any kind of proportional representation that relied on a list system, because that would give even more part power to party bureaucracies. Uh, so so if do, anyone is not familiar <coughs> with that, Steve, just break it down. Okay. Place. In many countries like the Netherlands, for example, or Israel, which is the most extreme case, you just vote for a party, and the party has a list of candidates. And depending on, let's say, um, that the party wins 10% of the vote, 
you go down its list until you reach the number of people who make 10% of the legislature and they're the ones who become MPs. Mm -hmm. That means that what determines whether or not you get into the legislature is how high you are on the list. Mm -hmm. So that gives enormous power to the party managers and I don't approve of that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I would strongly support the Irish system, which is where you have um, a multi-member seat, a seat with three to five MPs, uh, which t often corresponds to the local government unit, and you basically then rank the candidates in order of preference. And the good thing there is that if you're the voter, you can give a first preference vote to somebody from one party, but a second preference vote to somebody you like from a different party. And also you vote within the party that you support, as well as between parties. So if you are a Remainer Conservative in that system, you can vote only for people like Anna Soubry. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you're a Lever Conservative, you can make sure that Jacob Rees-Mogg gets your number one vote and you never give a vote to uh, you know, Heidi Allen. So I, I quite like that system. Failing that, the, other, the only other kind of PR system I would support uh, is the German system, where you have single member seats, but then there's a top up. This is what they use in the Scottish Parliament as well. And Steve, we're going to go back to Brexit <coughs> briefly because we are, um, to use the term, hurtling out or crashing out. Is yeah, it, yeah. I mean, is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? And is, where do you stand on Brexit? Because I, I've got no idea anymore. Well, I was actually on the fence in terms of Brexit until really quite late on in the referendum campaign. It was only about a week before the vote that I decided I was going to vote leave. And I did so with the firm opinion that both of the campaigns were doing their best to get me to vote for the other side. <laughs> uh, they were so utterly useless in terms of the quality of their argumentation. And I, I decided to vote Leave for two reasons. W one is because I think that not being in the EU will open up the range of options for British policymakers and the British electorate. Right now, there's a whole range of particular policy positions, some good, some bad, that you just can't follow because they violate EU rules and regulations. So uh, a kind of radical free market policy is not possible, but also a radical socialist policy isn't possible, which is why I'm quite convinced Jeremy Corbyn voted leave, by the way. Mm. As are we. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, is as is pretty much everyone, I suspect. Yeah. Uh, so that's one reason. The other reason is I think that um, I strongly suspect that the EU will not be around in its current form in five years. It may well have collapsed altogether because it has... Uh, fundamental design flaws, which are acts of hubris that the European politicians engaged in at the Maastricht conference. Uh, obviously the Euro, which pretty much every economist on the planet told them was a total disaster. Uh, but also I think the whole idea of an EU, common EU citizenship, I think that was an act of hubris because there is no European demos. Uh, people still think of themselves as French, German, Italian, Dutch uh, and Spanish, not uh, European. So I think that if the hotels are you know, burning, better to get out before the ceiling comes in, mm. uh, is my but view. But you don't think uh, uh, crashing out without a deal. We, we <coughs> both voted Remain, by the way. Because we're good people. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Uh, he always does that joke. We always get a ton of hate for it <laughs> online. Um, so now it's become a catchphrase. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but uh, we both voted Remain. But do you not think this idea of crashing out without a deal is going to be horrific? Everyone's going to die. We're all going to be eating rats. And uh, no. Uh, the the word crashing the term crashing out is actually a loaded propagandist term. Yes. What that actually means is that we will legally leave and we will then revert to trading with the EU on World Trade Organization uh, rules. Mm. That's what the actual legal situation will be. Um, now, I'm not saying it will be painless. Actually, there will be significant disruption if we leave without a worked out trade deal. If we go to trading on WTO rules, the reason is that what we have is a lot of transnational supply chains, uh, particularly for manufacturing, but for other sectors as well. And those supply chains will be significantly disrupted in the short term through things like customs checks and controls. And because so much production is done on a just-in-time basis, what that means is that uh, things could be delayed by, say, two or three hours. And believe it or not, that actually can disrupt the entire productive process because mm. everything is done on a, a just-in-time basis. However, I think that would be sorted out. Uh, in, a, in less than a year, uh, there will be a whole series of specific agreements made which would sort out particular problems like, for example, uh, aircraft not being allowed to take off from uh, British airports and fly over European airspace. I think that will be sorted out very, very quickly, for example. So I think that, uh, yes, there is disruption for leaving without a worked out trade deal in place and reverting to WTO rules, but 
uh, the disruption is not going to be the kind of catastrophic end of the world uh, that we're being told it will be by a lot of the press. That is quite simply uh, scare tactics, quite often deliberately designed to panic the public. Uh, but having, I fear, actually for them, the exact opposite effect. Everyone thinking, my God, not another scare story. Uh, and they're actually ignoring what might be genuine problems in some cases. Uh, but also, uh, it, it's a case of taking a hypothetical worst case scenario and assuming that because this might happen, therefore it has to happen. And so you will get these reports saying, oh, companies have done contingency planning for running out of food or things like that. Uh, so the, the implication is, therefore, this is what's going to happen. That's wrong. Contingencies are things that might happen, mm. not necessarily things that are going to happen or even have a probability of happening. And any company in its right mind with responsible directors and managers is going to plan for contingencies. That's what you always do. You always plan for worst case scenarios and things going completely, you know, pear-shaped, that uh, you would be irresponsible not to do it. But that doesn't mean that the probability of things going totally pear-shaped is actually as high uh, as people often think it is, much less the certainty that some of the press reports would uh, have you believe. And you, every time I go on my Facebook, I just see a list of companies that are leaving. <coughs> it's going to be the end of trade as we know it. Britain is going to become, you know... Uh, is it realistic that we're going to lose a lot of trade to the EU? No. Uh, there are two things that are going on there. Well, three things, actually. One is that quite a lot of this is changes that would have happened anyway. So Honda shutting down the factory in Swindon, for example, that's something that would have happened in any event. Honda is basically relocating all its production back to Japan. They've shut down a factory in Turkey as well, and Turkey has a trade deal with the EU. So some of this is stuff that would have happened anyway, uh, and it's now just a convenient excuse to say it's because of Brexit. Sometimes there will be changes because uh, there may be, for example, that if you have one of those supply chains, you'll relocate part of what goes on in the UK over to Europe uh, because it will then become less costly because you won't incur perhaps customs charges. So there is some of that going on as well. On the other hand, uh, what you've also got is uh, tra trade just going on as it did before. And I think that is actually going to be the bulk of what you see, simply because making big changes like that is very costly, and people are not going to do that if they can possibly avoid it. Uh, plus, the EU exports a very large amount to us. We, are, uh, we have been running a very large trade deficit with the EU, basically with Germany, uh, for most of the last 20 years. Uh, and it's been getting uh, worse and worse in the sense we are selling less and less to the EU. Uh, the Germans in particular are selling more and more to us. Conversely, our exports to the world outside the EU are steadily growing, both in absolute terms and as a proportion of total British trade and GDP over the last 10 years. So we are already less integrated with the rest of Europe than most other EU countries are. And for that reason, I think the impact on the British economy is not going to be as big as uh, most people imagine. Are we going to have a second referendum? No, absolutely not. I would put strong money on that. I'd give you, you know, really long odds against the second referendum because there's a clear and overwhelming majority against it in Parliament. And do you think Theresa May is going to... What's, what's, what's going to happen, do you think, with the Conservative Party? Because it's interesting because Labour in crisis, and we talk about Labour a lot, but we really haven't mentioned the Tories. They are also in crisis. The, the problem that both... The problem at the moment is that Theresa May wants to put through Brexit and she wants to do that purely relying upon Conservative and DUP votes. She knows that if she puts through a deal which involves making a deal with the Labour Party because of the terms that Labour MPs would insist on, which involves being in the customs union, um, it would provoke an enormous split in her own party. Basically, if she reached out to Jeremy Corbyn or beyond him Labour backbenchers, and she made a deal, probably Norway plus, as it's often called, uh, going in the European economic area, remaining in the uh, free, uh, free trade area, uh, then about all of the ERG, about a third of the party would walk out. Uh, they would effectively stand on their own platform as a separate party in all but name. I suspect they would keep the conservative label, but they would effectively be a new party. She obviously wants to avoid that at almost any cost. The problem is it's not easy to see how she can come up with any kind of deal 
that will command the support of enough Tory MPs and other MPs to get through Parliament. So she's in a very tricky position. So the Tory party is facing a really serious division, just like the Labour Party is. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, on the other hand, he also wants Theresa May to put through a Brexit deal with only Tory votes. <laughs> because he wants Brexit to happen, but he wants the Conservative Party to take, if you like, the blame for yeah. it. And so he thinks that then he can say, well, OK, we've left now. Uh, now's the time for a radical socialist policy to deal with the problems the Tories have left us with. Um, <clears throat> and uh, let's forget about Brexit and get on with electing a Labour government. Uh, and meanwhile, blame the Conservatives for any kind of, you know, bad news that does happen in the aftermath. But the, his problem is the kind of mirror image of Theresa May's, which is that A, he's got a block of MPs, as we can see, because they're leaving now, who are just totally against that because they're totally anti-leaving. But he's also got a lot of MPs who, um, if the choice is between making a deal with Theresa May and leaving without a deal, they'd rather make a deal with Theresa May. Now, it's an interesting question what will happen in Parliament in the next uh, month. It may be that we actually see the coming together of a coalition of MPs beyond the party leadership who will support something like Norway Plus. Now, whether the EU would then agree to that is another matter. I suspect not, because quite reasonably, they've said that you can't be in the single market and the um, tariff union unless you also accept free movement of labour. Mm. Quite reasonably, they're saying you can't cherry pick one part of the deal and you know, leave the rest out. Uh, and I think there's no, no way most Conservative MPs would support that. Uh, on the other hand, you never know, the EU also doesn't want Britain to leave on WTO terms. That would be very disruptive for them. So they might well actually go along with some kind of tweaked Norway deal. But the question is whether or not enough MPs are prepared at the last minute to break their party whip to form a cross-party coalition. I, I can't remember, I was talking to someone involved in politics who said that the EU are notorious for making last-minute deals. Do you think we're going to get a deal at the 24th hour? Yes, probably. I mean, I think what uh, the, the typical... Uh, thing that happens is that you get lots and lots of uh, photographs of uh, tired and maybe slightly intoxicated EU figures staggering out of luxury hotels at three or four in the morning after some they've pulled an all-nighter of like crash negotiations. And I suspect something like that may happen. The only reason why it might well not happen is that the issue of the Irish border is particularly intractable and difficult. And it's not easy to see how it's even possible for a deal to be made that will actually command a majority in Parliament. Mm. Well, you, you know, it's interesting times when the only party not in crisis are the Lib Dems. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny times. Well, I, I was listening to the, the radio, or maybe it was Newsnight last night, and there was a Remainer Conservative talking about how if we leave under WTO rules, he will leave the party. This is very true. I think, I think Theresa May is in an extremely difficult position, just like Jeremy Corbyn is. On the one hand, if she makes a deal, the only way she can get a deal through Parliament is to make a deal with a lot of Labour MPs. If she does that, the ERG and the Tory Brexiteers will effectively leave the party. If, on the other hand, uh, she doesn't do that, <laughs> given that um, there's no majority for any deal she's got in Parliament, uh, that means we would leave in WTO deals, we would have a no-deal exit, and at that point, a whole lot of people like Dominic Grieve, mm. Amber Rudd, uh, David Gork, uh, about half the cabinet and a big chunk of the party would leave the party then <laughs> and go over to join the train. So she's... Oh uh, she's... Uh, Fucked. She is, basically, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> you, you, can, you can say that. <laughs> yes, much. yeah, basically, it's like, in Persian mythology, when you die, you have to go across a bridge, and the bridge gets narrower and narrower as you walk across it, uh, and if you're virtuous, you make it to the other side. But if you're not, you just fall off and there's a bunch of crocodiles down there to tear you apart. And that's pretty much what she's in. The options are getting narrower all the time. And Jeremy Corbyn is in a similarly very difficult position. Do you know what the one thing uh, that I'm going to take away for this interview is, and I hope you do as well, is if you've got ambitions to go into politics, don't become the leader of a major political party. No. <laughs> it's just... What I find interesting with Corbyn, though, is that... This, this guy came to, to, to lead the Labour Party under this aura of being principled and honest and speaking truth to power and saying it like it is. Mm. And as you say, he probably voted leave and isn't admitting it. He, he's hedging his bets. He's trying to get the Conservatives to put through Brexit, which is what he wants to happen, mm. under the guise that he doesn't want it to happen. And it, it kind of puts into question his whole status as this honest, truth-speaking guy, doesn't it? Well, I... The point is, he's doing his job. 
Mm. I mean, his job is to hold the Labour Party's electoral coalition together and, if possible, to use that electoral coalition to gain power and have a Labour government. Now, uh, everything he does makes sense in that light. Uh, if he comes out and says, well, actually, I think you know, we should leave uh, the EU because that would make a more radical economic policy possible, which is almost certainly his view. He's come pretty close to saying that. Uh, of course, a, a huge chunk of the Labour Party's MPs and his membership would I would love him to do that. total fit and the party would disintegrate. I would love that so, so much. So he wouldn't win power. <laughs> On the other hand, if he comes out ardently for pro-Remain, as people like Polly Toynbee and The Guardian want him to do, uh, and campaigns to stay in or have a referendum, then he would lose a whole ton of seats in the north of England and a whole bunch of working class voters to the Conservatives or even a Renaissance UKIP. Uh, so he can't do that. So he's basically doing what he has to do to do his job. And that's what politicians' job is about. The idea that you can just say whatever you like in politics is extremely naive. Anyone who's actually gone into politics should realise uh, there's no point in being in politics if you don't actually get into power. Uh, and so obviously you have principles and you don't compromise them totally. But at the same time, you can't simply say... Uh, openly what you think all the time. You have to do things that will keep together the electoral coalition. You need to win power. Well, I think that's a great place to end it, really. And mm. um, uh, the way we end every interview is always the same. Uh, it's the same question. Uh, Stephen, what's the one thing that we're not talking about as a society or maybe in politics that we really need to be talking about? Uh, what a terrible idea meritocracy is. Uh, everybody at the moment seems to think that meritocracy is a great idea, it's the way to go, it's one of those unexamined uh, beliefs that nobody really questions or challenges. I think it's one of the worst ideas ever. Uh, and it has destroyed uh, education in this country. And I think a lot of the argument we have about education at both higher education level and school level uh, is really beside the point because the real problem, the thing that is destroying education as an activity, is that we use formal education as the way to decide who gets high paid, high status jobs. And this has had so many bad consequences, I hardly know where to start from the kind of arms race between pushy parents to get their kids into uh, the right school and then beyond that the right college to the way that higher education has become almost entirely about getting certifications which are supposed to give you a chance of a high paid, high status job, but increasingly not so because of overproduction of, of graduates basically uh, for the number of uh, graduate positions available. And so I think that's a really bad idea, but it has not been subject to any kind of serious criticism. Oh, hold on. So let, just to, just for clarification, mm. uh, when I think of meritocracy, I think of the best person for the job gets the job. The, 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 mm. the most intelligent, capable, skilled, whatever, yeah. gets the position, gets the promotion, right. gets the advancement. Yeah. Right. That is, that is, now, who would be against that? But that well, is you, not, apparently. No, no, but that's not what meritocracy <laughs> that's actually why I is. To yeah. That's not actually right. what it actually is. Yeah. There, are two th there are two sort of other aspects to meritocracy. One is the idea that the way you determine who the best person for the job is is by formal academic qualifications. Oh, okay. That's highly questionable, to mm. put it mildly. But the really deep problem is that the under unexamined and implicit assumption is that certain kinds of work, certain kinds of job, are better, more meritorious, more valuable, uh, more worthwhile than others. And what you do not want to do at any cost is to be doing a job that is not meritorious, worthwhile, valuable, and high status. Uh, and I think that is an outrageous idea and wrong on so many levels uh, that I, I don't know where to start. My view, very strong view, is that all kinds of work have equal dignity and are equally valuable. That doesn't mean they're going to be paid the same. For economic reasons, they won't be. But it does mean that all kinds of work should attract equal social status. And the idea that some kinds of work should have a higher social status and you then allocate them through this uh, supposedly meritocratic system of examinations and certification, I think that's a disgraceful idea. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, Dr. Stephen Davies, thank you very much for coming on. You're on Twitter at? Uh, Steve365. Steve Thrill will put that in the video. As always, follow us at TriggerPod and all the social media. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click that bell next to the subscribe button. And give us a review on iTunes. Thank you very much. And we will see you very soon. Take care, guys. Thank you very much. And thanks for watching. Bye-bye.